look at Jesus as if he was the greatest hippie known to humanity, right? I mean, that's honestly any picture I've ever seen of Jesus, long hair, you know, kind of grungy-looking robe, and trotting along. Well, sometimes it's not grungy, sometimes it's too white, but all the same. You know, he's plodding around, carrying lambs on his shoulders, hugging trees, having the kids on his lap, you know. Um, that's the image that we typically have of Jesus. Any picture I've ever seen of Jesus, aside from the picture of his death and mutilation on the cross, um, he's a pretty happy, go lucky, smiling, shiny kind of, kind of, you know, shiny, happy, happy. Yeah, okay. Anyway, he fits that bill, does he not? In, in almost all of the pictures that we have of him. And certainly how we teach him in Sunday school and how we talk about him in church, we think of him as someone who came to hold sheep and to play with children. We think of him as someone who loved to smile, spent his time cheering people up. We think of him as someone who came to unite humanity together for the common good. We often read those things into this text and into others. But the reality is, if we remove our preconceptions and read this text carefully with fresh minds, you will notice that our preconceptions of Jesus are a little wrong, especially in particular with, with this passage. Let me ask you, for those of you who are parents, if you, if you told your children to do something, and you sent one of your, your other children to go get them, and, and they say, Mom and, da Mom and Dad want you to, to do X, Y, and Z. And their response was, well, who is my mother and my father? I tell you, anyone who does what I like and what I think is my mother, my father, my brother, and my sisters. How would you respond to that? You're me. <laughs> right? 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 It doesn't take us long to realize that, that Jesus' answer here to Mary and to his brothers is beyond insulting, it's beyond a slap in the face, it is downright disrespectful and out of place. But we read something else into it because, well, he's Jesus. Which every child thinks, well, I'm Todd. You should be like, why, why doesn't that work? Jesus was not a great uniter. Never claimed to be, never wanted to be, when we read the scriptures carefully. Rather, he was the great divider. I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. I came to turn father against son, mother against daughter, sibling against sibling, aunt against, you know, you get the picture, right? Jesus does not claim to be the great uniter, but the great divider. He couldn't even get his own community to back him up and agree with him. The people of his community, in response to Jesus, what, what did they say? They said he was possessed by Beelzebul. Beelzebul and, and the, the prince of demons. That's what they thought of this Jesus. That's nice, right? Yeah. That Todd over there, he's, he's possessed by demons. <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, he is. Um, <laughs> forget his community. Did you notice his family's response to him? Did you notice why Mary and brother show up to begin with? They thought he was out of his mind. They wanted to restrain him before he opened his mouth and put his foot in one last time. You know, like, we better, we better get him, take him home, slap him around, shut him up. Keep him silent. This guy is crazy. Let's get him before we can't even claim him to be our son anymore, you know? This is, this is the way his family responds to Jesus. So when they show up demanding to see Jesus and the disciples come and say, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are here to see you, it isn't like they're coming for some tea and crumpets, you know? They're coming to take him away. They wanted to seize him. Jesus did not unite people. Rather, he divided them. And he made them choose sides. Do you listen to me? Do you follow me? And the words I tell you are from God? Or do you 
follow your own understanding of God. Now let me ask you a question. And this is going to sound odd coming from a pastor, right? But I want to ask this serious question. How do we know Jesus' words are from God? How do we know Jesus' words are from God? Because the Bible says so? How do we know that his ways were the right ways? And that his families and his people's ways of doing things were wrong? Was Jesus who he said he was? And how do we know that for sure? What makes Jesus' claims more authentic than, say, Jim Jones's claims? Or... Charlie Manson's claims, or David Koresh's claims. And if you say miracles, let me tell you, if you have the charm to get somebody to carve an X and then eventually a swastika on your forehead while you're sitting in prison, that's, that's pretty charming. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing it. I don't know about you. That's pretty charming. What, what makes Jesus' claims more right than theirs? How do we know Jesus wasn't out of his mind? If his own family even thought he was. The ones who knew him the most and the longest and the closest. If they thought he was crazy, how do we know he wasn't? And I'm leaving those questions open-ended, by the way. <laughs> Jesus came to divide. Yet, unite those who did believe in him. Yes, Jesus came to divide, but he also came to unite, but not in the way that we traditionally understand it. Notice that when Jesus' family do come to take him away, he totally rejects his family. Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here to see you. Oh, who are my mother and my brothers? I tell you, anyone who hears what I am saying and does the will of God are my mother and my brothers and my sister. Jesus rejects his own family. Family is no longer the group of people you are born into, according to Jesus. Rather, family is comprised up of anyone who obeys Jesus and by virtue of that does the will of God. Those are now who are a part of Jesus' family. That means Mary and, and Joseph and brothers and sisters, they're not in, but all of us who've never even talked to Jesus are because we follow him and we obey God's will. That is a radical, <laughs> radical overturning of the family structure in any society, let alone what family model we follow. Family is no longer a part of who you're born into, but who you follow. Now, I'm pretty sure that model is not going to go over well in the United States, where family is, we focus on the family, right? All these Christian focus, God wants you to love your family. God loves the nuclear family. Focus on the family, right? James Dobson and his, and his uh, Christian buddies, they, they wouldn't agree with this message that Jesus is preaching here. Right? Those who embrace it will be divided. Those who embrace this teaching, embrace Jesus, embrace God, they will be divided from whom they were united to. But they will be united in Christ. Christ is telling us, as he did his family and his followers, that we all have to choose which it is. Do we remain united with the world and divided from Christ? Or do we divide ourselves from the world and become united in Christ and in Christ's family? Now, if your whole family is following Christ, good for you. You don't have to worry about that division in your family anyway. But that is the choice that Jesus 
is telling us to make. And in America, it is so hard for us to understand this choice because, because well, our, all our families go to church. We all follow Jesus. Tell that to the Iranian Christian. Tell that to um, the Iranian Christian living in Islamabad. Or to the uh, or to the Iraqi Christian who's living outside of Baghdad in, in the Anbar province right now. Jesus divides. And those people have had to make a choice between being united with society and with family and with culture or being united with Christ. Those people understand Jesus. Even his own family, Jesus' own family, had to choose that. And we know that at least his brother James did eventually choose Jesus over the world. We know that from the Bible, we know that from history, we know that. The same James who was probably there with Mary trying to drag Jesus away because he was out of his mind. If we truly follow Jesus, if we truly believe in his gospel, the world will think we are crazy. They will. Just tell somebody you're religious. <laughs> See how it goes. Knock on their door and ask them if they'd like to talk about Jesus sometime. <laughs> We think they're crazy, right? And we're supposedly the believers. <laughs> the world will think we're crazy if we truly believe. But that is par for the course. For the world thinks Jesus and his message is crazy. That is how we know that the American Christ is not the real Christ. For Christ does not conform to America. Christ does not conform to Europe. Christ does not conform to any nation. For Christ is the Lord of all creation. We are to conform to Christ. Christ does not conform to us. So are you ready? Will you step out in faith and be crazy for the gospel? Whatever that means in your context and whatever God is calling to you, calling you to. Will you step out in faith and be crazy for the gospel? Let's be crazy for the gospel here in Stillwater together. Amen. Gracious God, we... Uh, We thank you for this challenging message. This message that is literally driving us crazy. Calling us to roll with it. Lord, we ask that you spark in us that craziness that changes lives. That craziness that values all people rather than just some. That craziness that doesn't measure on success, but measures on identity. The identity of us all being your creation. Let us be sparked with that craziness that chooses to be blind to anything but you. Let us be sparked with that craziness passionate craziness that calls us to dare to think that you can and have and will continue to redeem this world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.